Hi, I'm Laura Nelkin. I'm a knitwear designer. I live in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes region. This is a companion video for my latest Lola's Choice kit, Beadic Mitts. Beadic Mitts are a fingerless mitt with a Nordic beaded star on the back of the hand. These were born for my love of fingerless gloves and color work knitting, but instead of using a contrasting yarn color to create the Nordic star, I used beads, which you know that I love beads and Lola, my alter ego, also loves working with beads. Super goofy, right? So. Keep in mind that this is a companion video. The pattern is available separately, both on my website and Ravelry for Beadic Mitts. And there's also kits if you are a member of the club. And I do have plans for kits to come out at a later date in a bunch of different colors. These are so fun. I've knit so many of them and I'm excited for you guys to see all the combinations that I've come up with for kits. So you guys know these mitts are started at the cuff and they're worked this way. I used John Arbon's Exmoor sock, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the materials section. This yarn is lovely. It's toothy, it's, it wears incredibly well. It ends up making a really fancy utilitarian mitt that I think you're gonna be really happy with. And if you haven't knit with this yarn before, you are in for a big treat. You're probably gonna want some socks out of it too at some point. One thing for you guys to know is that beadic mitts can be made either with short fingers or they can be made fingerless. My producer husband back there told me I wasn't wearing enough knitwear for this video, so now I'm wearing mitts in two different colors for you. I think that makes it a little more like this is a knitting video here. So the um, short finger version is a little bit more finicky. This is my favorite way to wear fingerless mitts. It's just a little more finicky to work, or you can make them fingerless where you're just going to a smaller needle and working ribbing and binding off. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the video. So you do have an option for these mitts. The first thing that it's important for you to know is that you do need to have the pattern to follow along with this video. I am assuming in this video that you already know how to cast on and you already know how to read the pattern. I don't think that this is a great first knitting um, if you've never knit before, I would say maybe this should be your third or fourth thing. You are on small needles with small yarn and your placing beads. So it's got a few things in it that are a little bit more advanced. So let's jump right in and I will show you the materials that you need for beadic mitts. Okay, when we look at materials, the first thing you need is yarn, and you know we all love yarn so much. The yarn that I used for beadic mitts is John Arbon's Exmoor Sock. This is a four-ply sock yarn. It's got 60% Exmoor Blueface Luster, 20% Corydale, 10% Zwartles, and 10% Nylon. It is super wash treated, so it is washable, although I'll be surprised if you throw these in the washing machine, but it's a really durable, lovely yarn, and it will wear well on your hands over time. Along with your yarn, you'll also need two colors of size eight Delica seed beads. If you got a kit, you will see that you have a bag marked A and a bag marked B. Those are the two different colors that are used in the charted pattern. There are more A beads than B beads, so you can't really easily switch A for B. You will run out of beads if you go ahead and do that, so keep that in mind. You'll want to choose two different bead colors if you're choosing your own beads. These are a Miyuki Delica bead. You want to choose two key bead colors that definitely contrast with your yarn. If they don't contrast enough, the color work will get lost and you won't be happy with that. Next up, you need a tool for placing your beads. You can use a small crochet hook, about a 0.8 millimeter to one millimeter crochet hook, or you could use a piece of super floss. Either of those tools you can place bead with. You also, if you have a beetle needle, a beetle needle will work as well. In this video, I'll show you how to use the crochet hook 
and I'll show you how to use the super floss. Finally, you're going to need needles. You can work with double pointed needles. You can work with magic loop with one circular needle or two circular needles. Or new to me are these Addy Flexi Flips. I know they've been around for a few years now. They were hard to get for a while and they're a little easier to find. And I've bought them in a few smaller needle sizes. You'll end up using two different sizes of needles. You'll use the size that you need to get gauge and then one size smaller for the ribbing. So you'll cast on with a smaller needle and then go up to your needle that you get gauge with for working the body of the cuff. And that was an excellent segue into the next section, which is talking about gauge. So I'm just gonna clear this all off and let's get going with gauge. Okay, you know that to have success with your knitting, you want it to fit. And to have anything that you're knitting fit, you need to do a gauge swatch. Beadic mitts are worked in the round. So to make sure that you get gauge, you also need to work your gauge swatch in the round. And I find sometimes when I describe this to newer knitters, I get this furrowed brow. They're like, what are you talking about? So let me break that down a little bit for you. If you work a gauge swatch flat in stockinette stitch, like you're knitting a row and purling a row, you end up with a gauge swatch in stockinette stitch. But if you're working in the round, you're knitting every round. And for many people, their knit stitch and their purl stitch have a little bit of a different gauge. So some people's knitting in the round, their gauge is a little bit different if they're knitting flat. So that's why if something is knit in the round, you should be doing your gauge swatch in a round. I wanna teach you a trick for working your gauge swatch in the round, which makes it so that you don't actually have to work something in a small diameter, but you can be working it flat. It's a little bit of a cheat. And I know some of you have seen this before, but this might be new to some of you, and I wanted to make sure to touch on it in this video. So I have a swatch already going here underneath the camera, and I'm just almost at the end of the row. And you can see that I've worked a few rows in stockinette stitch, and I'm just kind of getting it going. And now I'm gonna work to the end of this row. And instead of turning my work and purling back, what I'm gonna do is take my yarn and give myself kind of a long strand along the back of my work. And then I'm going to go ahead and start knitting. Let's just make sure everybody can see this. Working across the front. When you do this, it's pretty important to cast on a few more stitches than your gauge calls for. In this pattern, the gauge that's called for is 30 stitches by 36 rounds. So I would cast on maybe like 34 stitches for your gauge swatch because those edge stitches on your gauge swatch are going to be loose and a little bit funky and you won't wanna be counting all the way to the edge of your swatch. So you'll continue and you'll make a swatch like this until it's about, I would say, four inches long, bringing your yarn around the back. If you are working from a kit one of these skeins, there is plenty of yarn to do your gauge swatches and make even the largest size of the mitts. I always tell people to save their gauge swatches just in case they ever have to like repair your mitt later or if for some reason you need a little bit more of that color of yarn, if you save all your gauge swatches somewhere, then you have a little bit to pull from if you need it. So once you've bound off your swatch, then you will block it in some warm water, just like you're gonna block your mitts when they're done. And then you're gonna let it dry all the way and then you'll lay it down and measure your gauge. So I'm just gonna do that quickly on the back of one of these mitts that's already done. So I'm gonna lay that down and just pretend this is my gauge swatch. And then I'll grab my ruler and I'll count how many stitches I have over two inches and multiply that by two and that's how many stitches you have over four inches. And remember, you're going for 30 stitches over four inches to make sure that your cuff fits. 
I am really good at segues right now because the next thing we want to talk about is sizing. And I get questions about this, like how do I know which size I should make? What I tell you in the pattern, I'm just going to look at my pattern to make sure I get it right, is that the palm circumference for the size that you're making. And what you want to do is just take a measuring tape and hold that measuring tape around your palm right underneath your fingers right there, the base of your fingers. And you can see that I'm about a 6.75 inches for my palm circumference. Now, if I want to make a mitt that I'm going to wear without a liner underneath it, I would definitely go down a size and choose the smallest size for knitting for myself because I know that I want my mitt to feel to fit really well and not be baggy. But if you're like me and you like to wear fingerless mitts or short fingered mitts over glove liners in the winter for a little bit of added warmth and comfort, then maybe I'd go up to the medium size because I know that I would have enough room underneath for a liner. So I'm kind of like right in between the small and medium and that's how I would decide what size I was going to make for myself. So just go ahead and like grab a measuring tape, measure around your palm, and then decide which size you're going to make for you. If you're gonna make them for a gift, um, that's always an interesting one, right? Like how do you know what size somebody's hands are? I tend to, if I'm knitting for a friend and I'm hanging out with them, I'll kind of like look over. I've, I've asked for people's hats before to just be like, let me see that hat you're wearing. It's so nice. And then kind of like gotten an idea of what size I should make for that person. So that's a trick if you're knitting for somebody else and you're not quite sure what size to make. If they don't live anywhere near you, you can always call somebody who lives with them and be like, hey, can you, um, I don't know, while they're sleeping, pick up their hand and measure it for a second and tell me what their palm measures. <laughs> so a few different options for getting sizing. Definitely ask any questions about that if you have any. So that's gauge and that's sizing. And the next thing we'll talk about is how to cast on and get you going with your beadic mitts. Okay, so for casting on beadic mitts, I used a long tail cast on, which is not a fussy cast on at all to use. You're gonna cast on the number of stitches that are called for in the pattern. You could also use a German twisted cast on if that's a cast on that you love to use or any other cast on for one by one ribbing. The trick that I love to do, and this is written into the pattern, is after you do your cast on, I like to work one row in my ribbing before I join into the round because I find it's much easier to not end up with a twist if you do that. And then you'll just use your tail at the end to close up that gap at the bottom where that first row was worked. So you'll just cast on with the smaller needles and work your ribbing. If you know you like your cuff of your mitt to be a little longer, you can definitely make the cuff longer than is written into the pattern. That is up to you. And once you make it through the ribbing, then you will switch over to the larger needle. And I believe you have a few setup rows after you switch to the larger needle where you just knit a few rounds to get yourself going and then it's time to start the chart. The chart is the same for every size which makes things very easy and you are going to follow the pattern as exactly as written and now I'm going to show you how to do that and how to place those beads. Yay, it's time to start working with the beading. If you have watched my other video on the bead aisle cuff, this is the exact same technique for following the chart and placing beads. If you haven't knit bead aisle, you might knit these and decide you wanna knit that as well. I'm wearing a bead aisle, oh, it's covered with my shirt. That's not very slick. I'm wearing a bead aisle here in a newer colorway, and I've been playing around with beads on that and coming up with different motifs for the center. I'm having a very good time with bead aisle, and beadic mitt is just kind of like taking off from that in a similar but different direction. So I have a cuff right here, and I've already worked up to round 12, because in round 12, if we look at the chart together, you will see that
that not only are we going to get to place some beads on round 12, but I also work the thumb hole. So it was like a way of having one step out to teach you two things. So the first thing that we'll do is look at how to read a chart. And I'm making the smallest size right now. So for the right mitt, I will be knitting one before I start the chart. And then I will be knitting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I need to knit a total of eight stitches before I am ready to place a bead A. So let me just grab a needle and knit those stitches for, with you. So I'm gonna knit one. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so I am right here on the chart and a dark box is PBA, which means place bead A. And what I'm going to do is place a bead on the next stitch on the left hand needle, and then I am going to knit that stitch. So I've got the beads right here. I'm gonna take the crochet hook. I'm just gonna put it into the bead A so that the bead is on my crochet hook. I am going to go into the stitch on the left-hand needle, slide that stitch off. If you feel uncomfortable, you can pinch right underneath that stitch to hold it in place. And you can see I'm pulling up that stitch so I can just pop that bead down onto the stitch. And now I'm gonna put that stitch back onto my needle and then go ahead and knit that stitch. And then I've got a bead A right there on that stitch. Now, if I go back to my chart, we'll see that I have two knit stitches and then I'm gonna place a bead B, so PBB. So I'm going to come back here so you can see that again. I'm gonna knit two. I am gonna grab the bead B. I'm gonna go into that stitch, pull it up so it's nice and tight. Slide that bead down onto the stitch, put that stitch back onto the needle, and then go ahead and knit it. And now I'm gonna knit one more stitch, and then I need to place another bead B, but I wanna show you how to do that with super floss if you've never done that before. Super floss is a little bit more finicky, but it can be really nice if you're out and about and you don't wanna have loose beads with you. Um, it comes packaged like this, so you just kinda of open it up, and then you will see that you have kind of a stiff tip on one end and then super floss on the other. This is used by people who have dentures or braces and kind of need to get into hard to reach places. One trick is that you'll see there's kind of this little floppy bit on the end right there. And it's really helpful if you cut that off before you start. I find that it kind of gets in the way if you don't do that. So now what I'm going to do with my super floss is pick up the bead that I wanna place and then bear with me here. I'm gonna go into the stitch with my super floss on the left-hand needle and now I'm gonna fold the super floss to come back through the bead again and then I'm gonna slide that super floss down, slide that stitch off, slide the bead on, put that stitch back onto the needle and then knit the stitch. And I'm gonna show you that one more time when I get a little bit to the next bead. So now I'm going to knit two. I've knit so many of these now, I kind of know the beadwork pattern without having to look at the chart that much. And now I'm gonna show you one more time with the super floss. My hand automatically went to the crochet hook because it's so easy. So now I am going to grab that bead, put it onto the super floss. I am going to go into that stitch with the super floss, fold it in half, put it back through the bead, slide the bead down, slide the stitch off, slide the bead on, put that stitch back on, and then go ahead and knit to the end of this row.
So that is how easy it is to place beads. Not hard, right? If you watch the bead aisle video, you'll see that I talk about reading the chart backward and preloading all of your beads onto your super floss so that they're already ready in order on your super floss to place in the pattern. That is certainly a choice for working the mitts, but I think you can probably get only half the beads on at a time. So you might need to kind of like load on through row 12, do that part, and then load the second half onto your super floss. But that is definitely a choice if you don't want to be looking and you just kind of want to know that the right color is lined up. Keep in mind that if you do that, you need to make sure that you have pre-strung your beads in order because you're gonna just be following along with which whichever bead is next on your super floss. All right, so now that we've done that, it's time to look at that afterthought thumb, which is something some of you might not have worked before. Okay, so there's two steps to the afterthought thumb. There's one step when you're placing scrap yarn, when you're working round 12 of the chart. And the second step is once you're all done with the top of your mitt, you'll come back and pick up stitches above and below that scrap yarn to work the afterthought thumb. So I wanna show you both of those steps. I am all ready here, ready to work the scrap yarn. And I'm working the smallest size, so I'm just knitting one and this is on the palm of the cuff. I've got all of my chart stitches on my back needle here. And now I am going to knit eight with scrap yarn. And you just wanna grab some scrap yarn that is smooth and that is a contrasting color to your working yarn so it's really easy to see your scrap yarn. And I'm just going to knit eight with it. Three, Sometimes I have to count to myself. Once you have knit eight with your scrap yarn, you can cut your scrap yarn, get that out of the way. And then what you want to do is take all of those stitches and put them back onto your left hand needle without twisting them. So just get them back on there and then you're gonna go ahead and take your working yarn and knit across those eight stitches. And what you've literally done is left a little hole with scrap yarn so you can go back and pick up those stitches later. Super easy to do. So now I'm just gonna continue on. And what I like to do is once I get a few stitches beyond it, I kind of go to the back side and kind of pull things up a little bit and tighten things up. If you want to, you could tie those two ends together. This piece ended up in the front, so you could like kind of, let's just do this together. Pull that to the back, and then you could tie them together if it's making you nervous. You probably don't need to, but certainly an option if you're worried about it getting pulled out for some reason. And then you'll just continue on through the beading chart and you'll continue on through the top of your mitt. At that point, when you're done with the beading chart and you have worked the extra rounds at the top, you will decide if you are making your mitts fingerless or with short fingers. Knowing that making them with short fingers is a little bit more finicky, but the fit is really nice with little short fingers like this. So if you know that you are wearing these gloves for doing stuff and you don't want anything to be kind of like flopping around a little bit at the top of your hand. These short fingers are lovely, but totally up to you. I always choose these and then I'm always not thrilled when I'm doing them, but I love the finished mitt, so it's worth it to me. I think most of my testers were like, I think I'll just do this version. They were like psyched to get that done and I totally appreciate that. So, the next thing to show you with that thumb is how to pick up those stitches. And what I've done is made like a little cheater swatch because it's just so easy to show you guys with a cheater swatch. When you go to do this, you'll use a smaller needle size than you used for your gauge. So you'll use the same needle size that you used for your ribbing. And the first thing that you're gonna do is go ahead above 
the um, scrap yarn stitches and pick up the right leg of every stitch of the working yarn above the scrap yarn stitches. So I've got, um, do I have eight stitches? I believe I do. And now you're gonna do the same thing below. And remember, you can kind of pull that stitch down if it helps you see it. So I'm gonna pick up the right leg on every stitch below. I believe one of my testers said that she placed a lifeline before and after she worked those scrap yarn stitches to make it a little bit easier. But I find that it's pretty easy to see those stitches and get the needles in. So once you've done that, you can pull out your scrap yarn. I don't love to use scissors at this point because if you snipped the wrong thing, wouldn't that be sad? So I just kind of go through, I pull it out. It's a little bit addictive to get those going. I've got my needles. You can see my little thumb hole there. And I'm gonna give myself, when I join the yarn, a nice long tail. And that is so I have something to weave in any little holes that might be there at the end after. So I'm giving myself a really exaggeratedly long tail. And now I'm going to knit eight. And now I am going to pick up two stitches along this little edge right here. So there's a stitch right here I can pick up and a stitch right here I can pick up. And what I like to do for that actually, because I find it easier, let me see if I can get this lined up to show you well, is there's a stitch right here. I'm gonna pick up this stitch right here and I'm gonna pick up this stitch right here. The goal with doing this is to try to mitigate having a hole so if you want to, you can even knit those through the back loop, which twists them and tightens things up even more. See, there's a little bit of a hole right there. So sometimes I do it and I'm like, oh, I'm not happy with that. And I wanna take that piece. So you might find that you try once or twice to see where it makes the most sense to pick up a stitch to not have a hole. And now I'm going to come around to this side and I'm going to knit eight and I'm going to get really snug right there when I go to knit the eight off the top. I'm like pulling in some extra yarn. Things are getting crazy. Now I am going to pick up two stitches on this side, get that tail out of the way. I'm gonna pick up this stitch right here, and I'm gonna pick up, I think, let's see here. I'm gonna pick up, I think I'm gonna pick up that stitch right there. There's kind of this art and science to picking up stitches, and I find it's different every time based on what I'm working, and the goal is to just try to close up any holes. So I'm knitting that and I'm knitting that, twisting both of those stitches to get them to be nice and tidy and tight. And now I'm gonna work one more setup row where I knit eight and then I'm going to knit two together twice. And that's taking those picked up stitches and knitting them together. And that just kind of helps close that up a little bit more. So you'll go ahead and do that. And then you've got that end to use if you have a hole to close up at the end. So that is how easy it is. Sorry, I miss saying, and my glasses are falling down. Things are getting very exciting over here. Um, I miss saying that once you're done working these setup rounds, you are going to go into ribbing for your thumb. So you can see the thumb right here has a little bit of lovely ribbing after you have picked up those stitches and then you are going to bind off that little thumb so it's nice and tidy. 
um, then you definitely want to block your mitts. So let's talk about just kind of finishing up. I wanna show you one trick for weaving an end at the top of a finger or the top of your mitt and a little bit about blocking. Okay, so there's one last thing that I want to show you and then you know everything that you need to know for beadic mitts. I, this is something I haven't shown before in a video, but it's how I, when I bind off in the round, how I finish off the end from the last bound off stitch to the first bound off stitch. So you end up with a really nice, neat edge. And I realized as I was doing the mitts that was happening at the top of every finger and it was happening at the thumb. And I thought it would just be kind of fun to show you that as a little extra. If you have a different way of doing this, I'm always happy to hear other ways. I feel like there are many ways to kind of do the exact same thing in knitting. It's one of the things I love about it so very much. So on my needles down here, I just have a big old swatch that I'm almost done binding off in the round. I'm using some bigger yarn here to just make things a little bit more clear. I'm binding off my last stitch and then I am bringing that stitch up and over and then you just cut the end and pull that stitch through. And that does not look very tidy right now at this point, right? It feels like that could be like really tightened up and made to look more pretty. So then what you do is take your end and put it onto a tapestry needle. And then you're gonna come over to the first stitch that you've bound off, which is always like at a little bit of an angle right here. You can see it's kind of angled like that. And I'm gonna go underneath both legs of that stitch. And what I'm trying to do here is simulate making one more stitch that joins the last bound off stitch with the first bound off stitch. So you can see it's already looking so much better there, but the last step is to take your needle and go through the center of that stitch right there. And then if I pull that up, you'll see that I made a stitch kind of look exactly like those other stitches. The goal with doing this is that it would be hard to tell the beginning from the end, right? So that's, I feel like finishing is a really important final step of your knitting. So I wanted to share that little bit with you and I hope that it is helpful. So weave in all those ends and then block your mitts. This yarn blooms stunningly after it's blocked. What I loved about working with the Exmoor yarn is like if your needle falls out, your stitches are, if this yarn's a little bit sticky and grippy, even though it's a superwash yarn, so your stitches will stand beautifully and wait for your needle to go back into all of the stitches, but it definitely softens and blooms when you go to block it. So just put some warm water in your sink with a little bit of wool wash, let your mitts hang out in there for a little while. You don't want to use hot water or cold water, and then drain the water out, squeeze the water out and just lay your mitts flat to dry. You definitely aren't stretching these out like you would with something that's lace. You just kind of want to lay them flat and let them dry overnight. I thought it would be fun under here. I have, you can see that I did three different color ways to start for the beadic mitts. I've got, I haven't named them yet, but I've got a kind of purple one and a blue one and an orange one. And I actually also have my mitt here that I got when I was in Shetland. This is knit by Wilma Mackelson. And if you've been following me for a few years, you've probably seen these mitts in different fall and winter photos because they're on my hands often with a liner underneath. They wear incredibly well. This is Shetland wool. I think it's from Jameson's. And they've got, you know, a smaller kind of Shetland star on there. And these were definitely my inspiration for like, I want to do a beaded mitt in this genre of mitt because I know that I wear them so very much and it's fun to see how well these worn. I can't tell you I wear these. I've worn these for years and they still look really, really fabulous. So these mitts are going to wear just as well as that, but they got a little bit of bling, a little bit of fun to them. Definitely let me know if you have any questions. I am happy to help you and support you in knitting beadic mitts. 
Um, I'll have links below for the pattern. If you want to hear when more kits come out or other patterns come out, make sure that you're signed up for my mailing list. We'll definitely have a knit along thread in Ravelry as well. So you're welcome to join us over there or leave questions here. I am very excited to see your mitts start to come off your needles. Thank you so much. 